Hi there, can you all hear me okay? Uh, so my name's Karim McSherry and I am the legal director for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, which is an organization uh, based in San Francisco, but we have outposts around the world these days, um, focused on digital rights um, and civil liberties and making sure that technology serves justice and not the other way around. And I'm Jim Nettles, and I do way too many things. Um, I am a science fiction, urban fantasy, horror, bit of this, that, and the other writer. I'm also a nonfiction author, write a lot, a lot of stuff in the technology, privacy, data security space. Um, but for purposes of this, the main reason I'm here is I am involved in a lot of different technology companies, IP work. Um, I do a lot of risk management work, disaster recovery, business continuity as well as a lot of work in terms of um, how technology works, how it impacts companies, businesses, individuals, things along those lines. So. Okay. Um, so we're here today to talk about one of many bad ideas floating around D.C. these days. I mean, they're a legion, and you will see me on many panels talking about this in the next <laughs> three days. Uh, but we'll get started with this. The Restrict Act. What does Restrict stand for? I had to look it up. So um, this is um, a bill in the Senate, and it is the Restricting Emergence of Security Threats That Risk Information and Communications Technology, because they love their acronyms. Um, but what it is, is the Restrict Act. And a lot of people think of it as like, this is the TikTok ban. Um, but it's a little bit more than that. So let me just sort of like lay out what it is and why um, you should be concerned about it while why we're concerned about it. Um, so the background is that, um, as many of you are probably aware, there's a lot of concerns that <clears throat> specifically China is collecting information about people in the United States. Um, and particularly that they're doing it via TikTok. Now, in fact, um, in security circles, they don't just worry about TikTok. They're worried about all of the different ways in which your devices are sending information about you all over the world and not just to China. Um, also, maybe to your local government, but that's another panel. Um, so there's a worry about that, right? And it's a national security concern. So what do we do about this problem? What do we do? Well. Um, there's an idea that perhaps we should empower the executive branch to basically block or mitigate any such um, collection. So specifically, um, what it does is it authorizes the executive branch to block um, transactions or holdings of so-called foreign adversaries that involve information and communications tech and in the view of said executive agency, create an undue or unacceptable risk to national security. Um, what does block mean? Well, block means also sort of mitigation measures, as in me measures that the agencies can take to um, mitigate the risk of, of that uh, collection and um, sharing information. Um, <clears throat> so it's not completely clear in the legislation what that real th those measures are and how they will be limited um, or not but probably will look like things like forcing a removal of an app like TikTok but not just um, from app stores so you just can't use it can't get access to it or you could have access to a legacy version but you can't update it um, or even could go as far as forcing sale of a company um, to a domestic organization, for example, or just kicking it out. Um, to be clear, though, it's not just limited to companies like TikTok, and this is where we start getting worried. Um, it also includes broad powers for the executive to punish companies that might be facilitating um, evading um, any such uh, mitigation measures. So what does that mean? That means like VPNs. That means like, you know, basically there's lots and lots of ways in which you're even minimally tech savvy. You can get around a lot of these kinds of restrictions if you want to um, and if you have access um, via things like VPNs. So, but this would be a, uh, this would create a process by which um, the executive branch could go after those kind of companies as well. Um, if they think that that's, they're being used in that way. Um, small companies, big companies, doesn't matter. There's lots of VPNs out there. Um, so that's one worry is that, and what all of this should suggest to you, if this seems like kind of broad and vague, that's the thing. It's broad and vague. 
um, and sort of leaves a lot of power in the executive branch to decide what mitigation measures are necessary or aren't necessary and so on. So that's kind of worrisome. Um, and then the other worry that we have is that there's very limited oversight from any of the other branches. So Congress has the power to designate or de-designate targets of the blocking or the mitigation measures. That's it. That's Congress's power. End of story. Designate, de-designate, full stop. Um, <clears throat> the executive branch doesn't have to offer to a court or anyone else much of an explanation for, for how it's applying the law. Um, it sort of might have to, but if it claims that it can't because national security, you know, basically it would be a security risk if we tell you why we're doing what we're doing, so we're not going to tell you, just trust us. And at EFF anyway, just trust us is not our favorite way of approaching any of the branches of government, and it's um, certainly not here. So there's not a lot of transparency here. That's worrisome. Another thing that's worrisome is that while it's written as if it only targets companies, in practice, it could be used to force companies to cough up all kinds of user data, so data about you. So if an if a executive branch is investigating a company, one of the things it likes to do is say, huh, so how are, what's happening with your user data? Where is it going? Well, in order to answer that question, it's going to have to look at a lot of user data, and that could mean you if you use TikTok or anything, any of the other um, apps that get targeted. So that's worrisome. Um, Sorry, the other sort of even more fundamental legal problem is that it's probably unconstitutional. So the first, first, because what it does is it affects what's called a predicate to speech. And so basically it's like communications technologies that people use to speak. The First Amendment protects those too. The First Amendment also protects the right to access speech. So you should have the right to basically make TikTok videos and watch TikTok videos. And people use these for all kinds of things. They use them for very silly things, but they also use them to share information and educate people and, you know, for political speech. Um, and so if the government wants to regulate that kind of technology and that kind of speech, right, by one step away, it needs to show at, at a minimum that its law, the law is narrowly tailored to a substantial purpose. Um, and this law is like, whoo, all over the place, covers all kinds of things, and probably is not going to pass muster. I will tell you a thing that I have been learning over the past several years as EFF gets involved more and more in um, dealing with Congress and lobbying. It turns out when you go to Congress and you say, you know, this is unconstitutional, they say, you know, that's a problem for the other branch. We're going to pass it anyway because it looks good and makes it seem like we're doing important things over here. This is disappointing to me. I sort of thought if you told someone it was unconstitutional in advance, they would say, oh, maybe we should fix it. Turns out that's, that's not what you get. Um, <clears throat> so even though it's unconstitutional, it may in fact get passed. And it's set up in such a way that it's going to actually be a little bit hard to challenge in court, but don't worry, we'll manage it. Um, so that's sort of what it is, why we worry. You know, at the most basic level, the way that I think about this is I don't think the government should be dictating what communications technologies we get to use or not use. Um, I, this, and if you are worried about user data privacy, which you should be, that completely, um, there's a better way to get at it. The better way to get at it is to have a comprehensive federal data privacy law, which we do not. Well, we have data privacy laws. They're 30 years out of date. They are not very good, and they're not very protective. And what we need is ways of protecting user data that's collected in, by all of the different companies. You know, we have a problem of corporate surveillance that is terrifying. There's a lot of companies that know a lot about you and share that information amongst themselves with the cops and with foreign adversaries. We don't like that, which we don't. Let's pass a law that actually gets at that rather than a law that just focuses on specific technologies in a way that's really vague. So that's my pitch. Restrict Act is bad. And go to EFF's Action Center, action.eff.org, and you can talk about it with your government. So now I'm going to have the first 
this weekend, and definitively not the last, of me going and arguing both sides of this. The first of which is that coming from a technological standpoint, there's a project I'm currently involved in where we're helping to develop and design um, basically technological risk management policy for insurers to be able to start insuring and managing against a lot of the technological risks we see. And as a part of looking at these, these projects and policies, when you also look at some of the things that are currently going on, because again, this act is known as the great TikTok ban, but that's also not the only company that's specifically listed. Another one of the companies that was specifically list, listed is Huawei, which is a, they put out a lot of hardware routers, stuff like that you're putting in your houses, a lot of stuff going into businesses. And they got busted a number of years ago because they were putting back doors into all of their routers and chips. Kubernetes, also out of Russia, another organization that I have supported a lot of work they've done over the years. However, they've also gotten popped for a number of very questionable activities and some of the things that they've done over the years. So the first thing I'm going to say is we look at this, you know, from a pure technological aspect. The law is way behind on where technology is, and it cannot, nor will it ever catch up, because it can't <laughs> respond to that quickly. However, we can put a lot of very guiding principles, because I do believe we are lacking a lot of things in terms of how we manage data, how we manage privacy, how we manage security. But I'm also very much a free speech advocate. And this is one of those things when we look at platforms, one of my biggest concerns is the ability to weaponize this act and use it to shut down platforms because again yes this this particular version is talking about foreign owned companies that doesn't mean it can't be leveraged into the next version that says we can limit and restrict what any social media platform can use and say we already have enough restriction and limitation happening on a lot of different platforms on what can can't be said what can and can't be done and so I look at this very much as a slippery slope act. So if we try to look at what I think, because again, we know that this was a political move to go and say, we don't like TikTok because the PRC can get to data. Well, <coughs> the vast majority of the data that they're able to get to is the same stuff you're posting on Facebook or pick your platform here. Um, so one of the big arguments that's been made is about biometric security, facial recognition, da 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 da, you've already given away. Um, this project I was involved in around a lot of the biometrics where we were looking at facial recognition, trying to do certain things to help secure certain kinds of data, accounts, financial transactions, things like that. However, we've already proven the fact that largely that's irrelevant. Okay, let's talk about iris. Let's talk about all the biometrics. But again, we've given away so much data that a lot of the things that we would look at from science fiction and go and say, oh, that'll work, facial recognition, you've already given away. It's already plastered all over social media in so many different ways. One of the things that we do know the PRC is actively doing is mapping, cataloging, and basically scooping <clears throat> up every bit of data they can get from publicly open platforms. Like I'll be all over a bunch of pictures all this weekend. I do a lot of media. I do a lot of interviews. My, my voice, my picture, my likeness, all of that is everywhere. And when we start talking about generative AI and some of those technologies in later panels, I can be spoofed very easily. Now, they won't get the snark and the smart ass, but they will be able to get, <laughs> they will be able to get that likeness, the voice, and past a lot of things. So when we look at these kinds of acts, some of the things that have come up are the idea of, because I put TikTok on this phone, what else are they accessing on the device? Okay, There is a security question about, because I have an app loaded, what else can I access on this device or on my computer or some things along these lines from a te technological standpoint? And if that was what this act was trying to address in the fact that we are sitting in the midst of a cyber war event currently right now, we're on we're fighting a cyber war event on a multitude of fronts so there is a cause for governments to do the things that they need to to protect their people however as highlighted this is not written that way 
This is not written in a way that is meant to really defend or protect. It is about a power <clears throat> grab. It's an information grab. It is another way to potentially restrict platforms. It's a way to, to restrict free speech. It is a way to restrict your access and access of other people to legal platforms. So the next question becomes this, which is an argument I always make, is what is our obligation as users of these technologies for personal responsibility and personal knowledge and education because we have a tendency to go and say, oh, it's in the App Store, it's fine. Well, I mean, if we look at Pokemon Go, when that got released and all of the different things that that was scooping up and grabbing when that first was released, because <coughs> nobody reads the EULAs. I read the EULAs because some of them are funny. Um, but if you read the EULAs and you see some of the things that you may be giving away to play with an app, because if it's marked as free, it's not free. And I think that there is a cause to do a lot more to educate and require information to be presented to people about the technologies we're using and how. But we all know that we will not read them, we won't use them, we'll click the button that says accept and we will do the click the box exercise. So looking at that, looking at things like Restrict Act, looking at the ability to come and say, is the government coming in with a power play to say, well, our average person, our average citizen, our average user is too stupid to do the things to protect themselves, therefore we're going to take action to do it. Or, as we see with some governments, where governments are limiting what applications you can load onto your devices. I have worked for a company where I was very restricted in what I could do, what kind of applications I could load, um, TikTok is very specifically a restricted application in a lot of environments. But some of the environments I went into, I could not carry this device if I wanted to. I couldn't carry in a USB drive. Pretty much it was just short of me walking in naked in a kilt. Okay, not quite that bad. But I couldn't walk in with any electronic devices because of the potential to breach data environments. So when we look at applications, when we look at things that we're loading onto these devices and the ways that they can be used, we have an obligation to educate and understand ourselves what we're using and playing with. But again, my concern is when we look at acts like this is how can it be weaponized and used in a way that A is not, quote unquote, wasn't intended because we do know that governments weaponize these things every day. And it becomes an easy way to say, we need leverage against the PRC, so we're just going to block TikTok, to, TikTok tomorrow, or as I call it, the toxic talk. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's to me, is one of those things that has a point to it. There are risks that we need to find ways to mitigate, and those risks are something that are very difficult for us to do as individuals. There is a role of government, there is a role of companies that are there to provide and protect some degree of security and stability. The problem I have across the board is that we're also seeing much greater restriction on the thought police, the things that we can and can't say, how we can approach them. This is where I think this is problematic and this is one of those things where I think the Restrict Act is potentially going to be another problematic case. Yeah, I think that that's right. And one of the, one of the questions I usually get is, well, what will it pass? Congress is so dysfunctional, does anything ever pass? Here's the thing, the way things pass now in Congress is they get shoved into end of year so-called must pass bills. Big budget bills, defense bills, where it's like no one wants to vote against it because you know you gotta get it through and it's the 11th hour and we're about to go bankrupt and all this stuff. So then all kinds of stuff gets larded up in there at the last minute often people don't know all it has to happen is that it has a, had a hearing has it gone through committee there's some like procedural stuff um and restrict actually is potentially in that place where it could get shoved into bill in a bill at the last minute and then we just deal with the fallout later so just like it's this isn't a sort of entirely theoretical threat um i i don't know that we're there yet there are a number of, of different organizations that have talked about this particular bill and sort of made noise about it, but it's just something to be aware of. It's not an inconsequential threat. One thing, although I wanted to pick up on um, that, that you were saying is I, I do think that there's a lot of work to be done 
um, educating ourselves and educating our friends and family and communities about how to protect your own privacy. Um, we always say, you know, privacy is a team sport. So when you protect your own privacy, you're also potentially protecting the privacy of your communities, the people you talk to. So, you know, using encrypted messaging, um, which is easier and easier to do now, using private browsers if you're doing anything that maybe you don't want to be snooped, et cetera. There's lots of, actually, fortunately, um, things that you can do if you invest some time and energy. On the other hand, I also think that it shouldn't be a world in which all of us sort of have to become security experts in order to sort of function in the world, right? That's not, shouldn't really be on all of us. Um, this has come to the fore a lot in an entirely different context, which is that in the wake of the Dobbs decision, there were a number of people who realized all of a sudden that the inf information was being collected about them that might be used by law enforcement um, because activities that used to be legal are now illegal. Um, and however you feel about that, it was a wake-up call for a lot of people to really pay attention to corporate surveillance in general, not just TikTok, but in general. Um, but, but that sort of takes me back to, and again, people sort of, there's all these security guides. EFF has security guides. We can tell people like how we, de in detail how to protect yourself, and we try to make it simple for regular people to use. But again, that's not great. You know, that's not really a great default. It's kind of like I think about when when Europe passed its GDPR, uh, all of a sudden now you get little pop-ups when you go to a website that says, we use cookies, accept or don't. And now we all just consent to that too, right? Do you go in and like look at all the different cookies and there's dark patterns that's set up in such a way like you think you're saying yes, but actually you're saying no, et cetera. Um, it's not a great thing to just put the onus all on users to you know, protect themselves and their communities, which again pulls me back to why we actually really do need comprehensive data privacy. We came close to it a couple years ago, um, not hearing much of it right now, but that should, there should just be like universal outcry for that on the part of everybody. There are so many different issues that we are worried about when it comes to technology that if we just had really good privacy, we, it would take us like 50% of the way towards um, where we need to be on many, many issues. And uh, that's one of those things I would agree with entirely. Um, because again, if we, it, there's no way to spend, even as a privacy security expert, somebody who does it every day, day in, day out for a living, there's no way to keep up with everything that's going on and every active threat and every opportunity. So we have to operate to a certain degree of trusting and hoping for the best, understanding at some point something's going to happen. And we can be pissed off and aggravated about it and then move on. This is part of the cost of living in a digital world. And I wish we could say we were all ethical. I could wish we could say that um, everybody operated in a way that was respectful to the rest of the world. And if we did that, we'd all have a much better day and we'd all have a, well, I we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't. Well, I would be here. I got to go. I got to go right. Um, but anyway, I got to go drink. Oh, uh, no wrong. <laughs> but when we look at the world that we are actively in, and I think this is one of the big challenges looking at this act looking at a number of things that have, have come through again i look at this being a problem where the legislation is being reactive and it's something that can be sold to stoke fear and control not something that delivers value benefit and protection to the people it's designed and because we're also in this global world it's not just about what gets passed in the u.s stays in the u.s because we see things like GDPR influences case law here, things that get passed in California and New York, then fundamentally propagate through everywhere, which also frequently is problematic. Um, because again, things that seem like a good idea or sound like a good idea cause big knock-on ripple effects, deal with them way too often. So we, ha we have to look at, are things like, if the Restrict Act comes through, what's the reciprocal going to be from some of these other governments? What's the reciprocal act gonna be from some of the other corporations we deal with? What is going to be the ripple effect when these things get passed if they're done in a way that is designed to be for political leverage, not for the benefit of the people it's designed to protect? 
I think that that's right. I have one more thing to add, and then we might want to, I don't know if people have questions, but we could make sure we have time for that, too. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I do think about when I look at um, laws like the Restrict Act is, uh, I was at a conference a, a year ago, and it was all about China and all about lots of concerns about China and Russia and all the information that they're collecting about all of us. And legit, right? This is not, um, I'm not sort of saying that's not happening, because it for sure is. But um, from where I'm sitting, what I hear a lot from people is when they're worried about government spying on them, they're more worried about their own government. They're more worried about their local government. They're worried about the security cameras that are all over their neighborhood and not knowing exactly what information is being collected and what's ha what's the information is being used for, who's retaining it, how. Um, they're worried about their state governments. They're worried about the U.S. government. We know the U.S. government spies on you. We've been suing them over it for 10 years. Um, so, like, I'm, so, like, I worry about foreign adversaries, sure, absolutely. But I think for day-to-day -day life, people are at least as worried about their own governments as they are. Um, if, like, I think worrying about China collecting information about you, that's very abstract. Right? But the camera on your corner, that's right there in your face. And we also know that those cameras tend to be um, unevenly placed. So certain communities are way more surveilled than other communities. And anyway, I just, um, that may also be another panel, but I, I would hate for sort of, or it, it troubles me when I see a lot of energy focused on foreign adversaries and not enough energy focused on um, local local surveillance um, at the same time. There's sort of that. You, and you'd think it would be, because there's so much. You, you should have more local control. But I think most people don't feel that way. And that's I'm, not their experience. I mean, this is where we see this right here is one of the most helpful surveillance devices ever invented. Um, you know, if you're in the middle of an incident response, OK, so I just had a, was having a conversation about contingency planning for something. And one of the things that we were discussing were, with some of the latest mm -hmm. shootings, were people sitting there, you know, live streaming and talking about oh my god i'm so scared i'm like you're an idiot you're broadcasting exactly where you're at you're telling people how many people are there i'm giving all the intel so if an active shooter is in a location i'm giving you all the intel hell no you put this in a hallway you start the live broadcast and the stream so that somebody that's coming in as a response has an active feed to work from governments also though in a lot of places have the ability to just go and say, oh, what phones are in this area? Let's just kick them on. Let's just look and see what's happening. Well, if I can do that for one situation, I can do it for any. Um, it, these ideas of when do we have privacy and rights and when do we not, the first thing becomes, again, what are the devices we're holding in our hands? What are the technologies we're purchasing, leasing, licensing? Because again, you don't own this device. You are paying for a right to use it. You may own the kind of brick, but at the end of the day, fundamentally, this is not yours. This is a leased device that those companies can then determine exactly what level of privacy you have and they can determine exactly how much you do or do not get to do with it. And they can determine, hey, we'll just give access over to whoever to see and record and monitor whatever they kind of really want to. Now, the business incentive there is if users find that out, they're probably going to go to somewhere that is more secure. But again, at some point, again, things like the acts we're talking about here can really go and pass and say, everybody in the country now just has to open up the device if law enforcement acts, asks for it. And the question becomes, what level of legal requirement is there to be able to do those sorts of things? Yes, yeah, so the good news is we're not there yet. Um, there actually is a fair amount that you can do if you want to um, to protect um, your your device, for example, if we're going to focus there, um, from law enforcement requests. Um, there's a couple things you can do right away, though, that the government does not like. One thing is you can use encrypted communications. Mm -hmm. And there's huge fights right now to try to require companies to build in backdoors to encryption that will basically only be used by good guys. At least this is the idea. This will only be used by good guys. And, and over and over, we and many others have tried to explain that they're technologically, like that's magical thinking. You can, this is not possible to do. If you build in a backdoor, bad guys as well as good guys can get in it. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, to their credit, I'm not going to 
you know, endorse any particular company, but Apple in particular has fought long and hard on this in the courts and elsewhere. Um, but also other companies are providing encrypted communications, and they have been explaining to governments around the world, as well as our own government, that <clears throat> there's lots of ways in which human rights defenders, journalists, ordinary people use encrypted communications in perfectly legitimate ways and should have the ability to do that. So that still exists, and your right still exists um, to <clears throat> control access to your device in a bunch of ways. You just have to defend it, you know, we, again, that's some of our training guides, but, it, and the, the, the shorthand, if you'll, for, pardon my French, is, you know, shut the fuck up Friday, which is my teenager's favorite term. But, you know, there's, when the cops come, you do not have to open your device under most circumstances. But many, many people do anyway, because they're intimidated, or they think they have nothing to hide, or whatever. There's a lot of ways. Um, <clears throat> but... The first step, though, is having your communications encrypted in the first place, and you can still do that. And one of the things that we've been talking about lately in, inside EFF is how important it is to sort of normalize encryption. It's not just for weirdos. <laughs> Encrypted communications is a perfectly legit thing to engage in, and you and your friends and family should all be using it. Uh, so take the steps you can now, because, they, they, and as, because the more it becomes normal, the harder it is to undermine those, um, it be, the more it's accepted as a right as opposed to a privilege. And just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not watching anyway. This is also true. Questions? Questions? Oh, whoa. Okay. Should we just go up the mic up there? Yep. Yep. I missed the cube. The cube was fun to throw around. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if this thing is on, but um, so my question and kind of comment, right, is in regards to the Restrict Act. Playing devil advocate uh, for the United States government. Uh, not that I'm a representative of the United States government, but uh, um, I think people will kind of get wrapped around the axle about the the micro aspect of it, as far as like individual uh, surveillance on individuals. Where I think the national security concern is more on the macro data, as far as like how to influence population, right? And I think that while I agree, right, that it's a potential concern um, when it comes to freedom of information. Like TikTok is a great tool for, you know, people to learn things uh, politically or what's going on uh, in Ukraine, wherever, right? Um, and that shouldn't be restricted uh, when it comes to a foreign adversary potentially, you know, owning that and collecting that information. One, I guess my question is, um, if TikTok were to, if this were to go away, like, I mean, what, we all know that something's going to take its place probably American made, right? Like that's like, that's, TikTok's not gonna go away. Um, or at least something like TikTok. But if the United States government painted the message, right, of like, hey, um, like this ban is going through because we know that the information they're taking is being used to potentially disrupt civil, you know, order, uh, within our government, because that's also the government's, you know, responsibility, right? Um, is that something you would lean more towards agreeing with? Because, um, like, in my line of work, we use things like that to help influence a population. So what are your thoughts on that? Not the micro, because, I mean, I think everybody kind of gets wrapped around, like, oh, the government's watching me. The government doesn't give a shit about me, right? Like, they don't. Like, they don't care where I'm at, what I'm doing. But what they do care is what an overall population of people may do or is doing and what they can do to potentially influence them to do one thing or the other. So, all right, when I first was on the stage, I don't know, 10 years ago, something like that at this point, I don't remember. Um, well, the amount of data we collected was, it was tremendous at the time. This is corporations, governments across the board. Tremendous amounts of data have been collected for a very long time. One of the big differences now in the last few years is the ability of how much we can now analyze and create and profile. So going back to this idea of national security, <clears throat> you're correct. For the most part, no, nobody gives two dams about what you're doing sitting at Dragon Con and a panel like this and, and where you're tracked and everything else. Except... <laughs> Um, I can do a tremendous amount with the data to map and see what panels you go to. I can tell you a lot about your personality profile. I can now take that data 
And with that analysis, I can strongly influence how you're going to view things. I now understand exactly who you are. If I know what TV shows you watch, if I know what stuff you shop for, if I know what you're, you know, how you're moving through a place like this, I can assure you I know what to sell you. I also know, know how to politically influence you. I know what language to use, what messaging to use. I know exactly how to steer you to do exactly what I want you to do. So the question becomes, influence is a great word. We influence people every day. At what point does it go from influence to manipulation? But with the data we have, there's a project I'm involved in, which I may or may not talk about when we get to some of the other stuff, where we are doing exactly this, where with the applications and things like this, we can watch and see what you're doing in an event, in an event space. We can give you experiences based on where you get to around it. And it's designed to be there for entertainment. It's designed to be there to help run an event. It's designed to be able to say, oh, you're standing here. You know it's about dinner time. Do you need to go grab something to eat? Oh, because you're at this particular room, you're in the EFF track, you might be interested on some of the educational material coming from the EFF. But at the same time, I can use that exact same material to tell a tremendous about much about you, where you're at, what you're doing. So if I'm sitting in some of the other environments I've worked in in my career or consulted in in places like this, from a monitoring standpoint, from an influential standpoint, if I would like to guide your opinion, I have tremendous power and tremendous capabilities. I don't care about the individual. I care about how I can classify you and I can take that data to say what pools you're in because then I start to work through the gradations of where you're at on the spectrum to know what specific messaging. And when I now take AI, which this is not this panel, but when I now take generative AI and some things like that, I can cross-reference that data to create a unique experience to give you a unique message exactly for what you need to hear to do exactly what I would like you to do. So the one thing I would <clears throat> add to that, because I think you were, though, also asking, like, but if there is a real national security risk, mm -hmm. should we do something? Yep. And, so, <clears throat> and so the way that I think about that is, like, there's a lot of really fundamental problems that we need to address. And I think the national security risk is real mm -hmm. and not, you know, not made up. And then the question is, is this the right solution? Is this the right way of addressing that problem? And I think the Restrict Act is 100% not um, because it's way broad. But that, does, that, that doesn't mean there shouldn't be anything or right, there shouldn't be any rules at all. Um, <clears throat> it's just that you know, we, need to have, we need to have political and legislative responses that are, you know, respect our Constitution. And sometimes that creates real trade-offs. You know? There's a lot of ways in which we could have perfect security or at least much better security. But I don't think we'd like that world. I don't think we'd like those trade-offs. Um, and so, you know, it, it it's tough. And I think it's <clears throat> disingenuous to pretend like these aren't hard problems because they genuinely are hard problems. Um, but I don't think restrict is not the right answer. Really big broad laws are not the right answer, unless it's the broad data protection for everybody. But even that's probably not going to do much for foreign adversaries, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's going to affect US companies, not, not foreign companies. The one thing I will say that we haven't talked about yet is a, a practical thing that did happen under pressure from the US government that I have pretty mixed feelings about is they've largely <clears throat> tried to force TikTok to sort of domesticate, um, meaning there's a sort of US company that is running much of TikTok subject to US control. And as I understand it, though, I don't know the details, there's a lot of like government people embedded in that company, um, which I find a little creepy, to be honest with you. I don't really, that, there's another way in which the government is being embedded in a company I don't, <clears throat> that's involved in communications. I don't actually think that's great. But I'm just saying there, it's not like it is, this has gone completely unaddressed while we've been waiting for this legislation to pass. Um, but we have more questions, so mm -hmm. thanks. All right, thank you. Um, you guys briefly touched on it, but I'd like to hear more thoughts about it. The uh, state sort of copycat laws. And the reason I ask is because I work at a major university in Tennessee, and Tennessee recently passed a law that universities can't have TikTok. 
Um, but in the, I forget if it's in the same law, but it was definitely in the same legislative session. Uh, healthcare institutions that take state money now have to also report uh, gender affirming care to the state. Well, those are different problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think that <clears throat> this, th there's been a lot of sort of state governments in particular, and which includes public universities. Um, <clears throat> in lots of government spaces right now, you can't use TikTok. I mean, they just, mm -hmm. agencies have put that in place. It's, it's, a, it's a done t thing. Um, and I haven't seen any First Amendment challenges to you know, state laws um, as opposed to sort of policies. And I've, I think that actually in universities, in particular, I don't actually think those are great because there's lots of ways in which students might be using TikTok to do cool stuff. And so it seems like, it, you know, it's not just, there's lots of different people working in universities and having an across the board rule for all of these people in very different kinds of roles um, in terms of like their national security risk seems inappropriate to me. <clears throat> with respect to reporting um, gender affirming care, um, with respect to reporting actually lots and lots of different kinds of health data. Um, I think those laws are overbroad and unfortunate and going to be used in really dangerous ways that are going to hurt people. That's what is going to happen. And, um, and I, but one of the most fundamental things is that it does is it discourages people from getting care because they're worried about what's going to be reported and how that's going to be used down the line in a moment when the legal landscape shifts almost yearly. Uh, for lots of people, and particularly vulnerable populations. So I worry about uh, this is the most fundamental thing where people won't even get the care in the first place because they're worried about reporting. Like that's, that's what happens as a practical matter. Yeah, and the only thing I'd probably add to that is on one hand, because uh, again, it's not just governments that are doing things. A lot of corporate entities are going because they're looking at it to an extent, uh, this is where I'm going to shift into risk management mode, right? It's the unknown factor, it's the fear factor, and it's the, it's one of those things to look at it and say, okay, if something were to come out that TikTok in particular was doing something where, for example, information was going and moving back, back and forth, or some information could now be used against a student because there was a belief. So for example, let me give you the counter argument about the TikTok ban. Just for, for governments and universities. We have a large populations of Chinese and, and, and Chinese descendant students in the United States. Now current estimates, the last estimate I saw, puts roughly 40,000 of them in some way, shape, or form um, are reporting back to the PRC. Large numbers otherwise are not. So because of using something like TikTok and because of that data, there could also be perceived that risk that you're protecting those people that are um, have immigrated from China here because we know that there have been cases, not necessarily from TikTok, but where social media data has been reported back to the PRC and used against those people to force them to come home, other things along these lines. So in an environment to protect a place where there's a lot of IP or you want that idea of thought, if you believe that there is a greater risk because of that one platform and because there is a governmental interest because, again, if it is a company in China, the government owns a significant portion of it or the government officials own a significant portion of that company. Don't ever have an illusion otherwise. I have worked with plenty of Chinese companies and organizations over the years. If there is that belief in that risk, then what you could argue is that we're doing this in a way to protect and ultimately help allow those people who have come here for to be uh, to be students or to immigrate here from China that we're giving them some degree of potential protection as a counter argument. Yes. Not saying that's my belief, but I'm saying that's the counter argument. It means that we have as a people to just affect our laws is through litigation <laughs> rather than just going through our representatives because in the past like you mentioned it doesn't seem like Congress cares whether the laws are actually constitutional when they pass it um, so I was wondering like how you guys approach that like do you try to encourage people to go through their representatives to try to affect the laws or do we just as 
of people just wait until we have enough people who are dissatisfied, then litigate, and then get something done. So um, at EFF, mm -hmm. we do all of the above. Okay. So um, we have, um, you know, I run the legal team, and mm -hmm. a lot of what we do is litigate. We mm -hmm. litigate mostly in U.S. courts, sometimes in state courts, sometimes in federal courts, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes abroad, though that's mm -hmm. a little trickier because it turns out people in other countries don't necessarily care what a U.S. organization thinks about their laws, but anyway. Um, but we do a lot of litigation where that seems like the right place to intervene. Um, so, for example, a law was passed uh, a few years ago that was supposed to protect children but mostly just punish sex workers. Mm -hmm. And we went to court and we challenged it on First Amendment grounds mm -hmm. and, you know, fought all the way up. And we didn't win everything, but we got it narrowed. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll do that. So we usually what we try to do is we try to stop the law in the first place mm -hmm. before it gets passed. Mm -hmm. But if we're not successful doing that, then next we go to court. Vice versa, you know, you, you, you guys seem schoolhouse rock. You know, if you don't make it in the courts, like for whatever reason we don't win in the courts, well, then you go back to Congress, right? That's why we have different branches. Um, but often I have to say that going to court is a lot more satisfying um, because, you know, win or lose, you get a ruling. Sooner or later, you're in front of a judge, you're talking to the judge, you are explaining, or a panel of several judges, you are explaining to them what the problems are, under the Constitution, and then sooner or later, you're going to get it. You're going to, there you're going to decide. And it's nice and clear. In Congress, um, there are some bills we've been fighting every year for like six years, and it just comes back. We beat it down again, and it comes back, and we beat it down again, and it can, it's a never ending battle sometimes for some of these issues. Um, so, you know, it is really important, though, that people do know that when they talk to their representative, I swear to you, it matters, especially if you pick up the phone. I know, I know, I'm just saying, if you call them, they're like, oh my God, someone called. Like that represents, in their little metric, one phone call is like 500 people. Um, an email is 50 people. So um, when, you, when you speak up though, and make noise about a law, um, they, if it's, especially if it's the congressperson's own constituency, they don't care that much if it's another state person or whatever. But if it's their own constituent, they record that, they pay attention. And when they suddenly hear from a bunch of people that something is bad, then they start getting nervous. And, they, and that's how you get stuff not put in must pass legislation. Because if the leadership of the Senate or the House gets the word that this, this law is troublesome, because what will happen is someone who's trying to get it through will be like, no, 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 everyone agrees on this. No big deal. Just slip it in there. Then they will. But if they get the word that actually people are upset, this is controversial, then you are much less likely to see that bill in a, an omnibus um, piece of legislation that has to go through on December 30th at midnight. Okay. Thank you. I'm mm -hmm. asking because I am a registered and it's really hard to just like not feel hopeless when the things I vote for just don't seem to be showing up. But if you say that is worth calling them, then I'll show oh, that more. No, it is 100% worth it. I will say it's, it's easier, even if it's hard, it's easier to stop something mm -hmm. than to push something through. And I'm sorry about that because there's a whole bunch of laws I would like to see reformed. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does happen. Sometimes things do go through. I, you shouldn't give up. We came very close on privacy legislation mm -hmm. a few years ago. We really did. So, you know, don't, don't give up. Thank you. <clears throat> My uh, question, in addition to what you said and the uh, gentleman addressed earlier was, um, and how do we um, get people to kind of change their head in the sand mentality because I was trying to get my girlfriend to come to this panel to try to expand her expand her mindset a little bit she kind of has a view she uses TikTok and I've told her countless times it's like uh you know I'm not I'm not partial to it I know some of the stuff and I'm beginning my transition into cybersecurity security as well and looking at some of the perils and pitfalls of of the digital world and things like that and what would you recommend to kind not to turn someone into that, but just to kind of highlight some of the perils and pitfalls of that, to kind of just say, hey, you know, this is some of the stuff you might want to be cautious of, to try to make them a little more aware. 
kind of bring them out of the kind of get their head out of the sand a little bit. So this is going to be one of those points where again I'm talking on both sides because I can be it and I can because I've done this quite frequently. I'll be on a room one side talking about privacy, data security, how evil every bit of social media is. It should all die, die, die. I walk across the room. Hi, here's how social media marketing works. <laughs> and I have people follow me and go, how do you have both conversations? And for me, the answer is the exact same every time. Act with intention. And if you act with intention and you understand what your goal is with a given platform, number one, then you're going to have a little bit better space. Now, again, I've got a device that has TikTok on it. We've studied it because we look at it from a perspective of information di dissemination and marketing and, and, and honestly how the algorithm works and how it works so well in manipulating people and users. How quickly it learns, adapts, and shifts. And how quickly it can be used to adjust opinions. I know because I've sat there and watched it. If you are doing something, and it's not just TikTok. I, here's one of the things I want to say. I'm not a big fan of the platform in a lot of ways, but I have a lot of respect for it because they have a well-developed platform with an extremely adaptive algorithm. And if you look at that and, you, and you're getting pulled into social media where you're going bam, 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 and then you look up and it's been two hours, that to me is the greater problem with the fact that you've got the device loaded. Um, it's be informed about all social media. Be aware of what you're doing and why, because it is so easy to get sucked into one of these platforms, whatever it is, and get lost. Like my wife has gone to using a timer. You know, and it's like, oh, nope, I've hit my half an hour I, I get of social media a day, and da da da. All right, it's it's done and over. I the other side of this is. No, I don't think you want to get entirely paranoid, right? Because when you work in a space and you spend all your time there, you get to see everything that can go wrong. And when you get there, that, that, that cements that view. And so one of my best friends in the world does cybersecurity, does, it, it, you know, does a lot of things along these lines. And we've had a lot of conversations over the years about platforms we use, platforms we don't, the ways we talk, the ways we don't. Just be intentional. Um, it's not something I would go and say, you have to be this paranoid about using the platform. Be aware. You know, so in terms of the other side of it, it is a platform that does allow in certain ways speech to happen that does not happen the same way on some others. That being said, be aware of what you're playing with. Be aware that there could be a risk, not that there is a risk. So, I mean, I know a lot of the things I've thrown out there today have been kind of from that, the world is going to end. It's not. But somebody's going to sell you something. Um. <laughs> so, just real quick, because I want, I want to make sure we have time for at least one more question. One of the things that we talk about a lot in, um, at uh, EFF is, um, in security trainings and that kind of stuff, is starting with some really, really basic threat modeling. And one of the things I always come back to is, like, if you're talking to a teenager their biggest concern is their parents, right? That's what they're worried about, right? Who's, who am I, my parents by? Are they going to know what I'm doing? Or maybe, and maybe some of their friends, right? That, like, just, mm -hmm. but starting where people are and figuring out what, what's their threat model. So rather than telling them what their threat model is, actually talking with them about it. Um, and then one of the things that's nice is you can pair that with, like, okay, so if you're worried about that, here's some very practical, simple things you can do. You know, and you just start in that place where there's, where it's not just like scaring people, but it's like, you know, talking with them about it and then giving them tools, giving them something to do so it doesn't feel, getting back to the earlier question, I think one of the things that can happen when we talk about surveillance is you can get to feel very hopeless really fast and and disempowered and just like, oh, forget it. And then you throw up your hands, you don't do anything, right? But actually you don't have to. There's like incremental things you can do to protect yourself and um, helping people know that I think starts pulling them into a different mindset. They're like, oh yeah, actually I could do something about that. Mm -hmm. And then they get in that habit 
So, you know, I don't know if that helps you with your wife, but, <laughs> but it may help you in talking with other folks around you about, you know, what are the threats and what can we do? Okay, uh, last question. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, uh, you said, Mr. Nettles, that we are in a cyber war or a, or a cyber inf information mm -hmm. kind of conflict. Um, and Ms. McSherry, you said that Congress is considering the Restrict Act and giving itself almost no power. I'm new to thinking about all this. So in my mind, Congress deliberately giving itself small a small amount of power sounds weird. Um, so my question is, are you able to speak to who are the actual players here? Like who's pushing this or what's going on? So Restrict was introduced by Senators Thune and Warner. So they're... Warner? Sorry? Elizabeth Warner. No, no, that's Warren. No, Warner. Oh, sorry. It's no, no, that's good. okay. Right. Yeah, I don't think she, this isn't her jam. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and I think that you're right. It is, a, it is a little strange that Congress would decide to disempower itself. Uh, I, and I think it's a real problem. And I think that, but this is one of the things that you specifically see in the national security space. We have seen it actually in many different ways. If you look at the Patriot Act, um, you look at other laws that have been passed in the midst of sort of national security panics, um, there is a sort of idea that this is actually the appropriate role for the executive branch. And over and over, we've actually seen Congress sort of step back from the kind of oversight that it should be engaging in. And that, and I think part of the reason is that a lot of folks in national security will say to Congress, this is too secret. We cannot share it with you because if that itself will be a national security risk. And um, so one of the things that might happen, for example, is there'll be, there'll be a subgroup of people in Congress who are allowed to engage in some oversight. And, um, and every now and then you will see one of them going, I wish that someone would ask more questions. And what they're saying is, I know something. I know that there's government abuse here, but I can't talk about it because I'm constrained. Um, that's what that's code for. And we know this because we've seen a pattern where sometimes there will be a senator who's sort of trying to, you know, sending out some hints, and then eventually information does come out, and it turns out that there's massive governmental abuse going on. Ha! Huh. Um, but again, I just, I, I, to the direct answer to your question is because I think a lot of the folks um, in national security go, go to their Congress people or go to, you know, the counterparts in the other branches and say, if you, over, if you um, in, uh, meddle too much in our space, if you require us to give you enough information to actually do adequate oversight, that will be dangerous to national security. So please just look the other way and trust us to do our job. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is, and so on the other side, it, again, way too many things I've gotten involved in over the years. Um, having put in a lot of FOIA requests, having put in a lot of requests for information from governments, one of the things that we also see a lot of is things that are sketchy or things that really are not within the purview of the government, then they contract out to certain government contracting agencies, government contract or contracting companies to go perform a service that sometimes is questionable whether or not it's legal or constitutional and that's why they move it to a private company and then specifically authorize them to act on behalf of certain kinds of surveillance, certain kinds of monitoring, other things along these lines. Um, and in fact, if you play follow the money, you can go watch some of the large company players as to exactly which um, VC firm backed them. I, I will say that much. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming. And um, we'll see you on some other panels later in the day. Thanks, guys. Yeah.